Welcome everyone to the Arlington Heights Memorial Library online. My name is Barb and I'm an Info Services Librarian. Thank you for coming. Our program tonight is Investing Made Simple with our presenter, Karen Chan. Karen has a lot of great information to share, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to her. Thanks, Barb, and thanks to the library. Uh, Arlington Heights Memorial Library has a long history of supporting financial education for its community, and I have a lot of respect for that. Um, I, I've always felt like that libraries and I are on the same page as far as wanting to make sure people have reliable information that's not not biased, or at least no more biased than, than we're able to, to um, you know, we, we strive for the least bias possible. So yeah, we're talking about investing made simple. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me, just a word uh, about my background. Um, I am strictly education. Uh, I spent 18 years working with University of Illinois Extension doing exactly what we're doing tonight, uh, personal finance education. I so-called retired uh, and formed my own little LLC back in 2012 and have been doing financial education on my own, you know, uh, no longer under the umbrella of the university since then. I am a certified financial planner. However, I don't practice. What that means is that I do not work with individual clients. Uh, and also to reassure you that there's no hidden agenda here, I don't sell any financial products or services. As I said, I am uh, education only. And tonight really is only education and it is not advice. Um, to help you understand what I think the difference is, I hope that you will leave tonight saying, now I know, fill in the blank. Now I can decide how that applies in my situation. Instead of saying, Karen Chan said I should fill in the blank. Um, because as I said, I want to help you understand investing better, but I will not be telling you what you should be doing with your own dollars. Uh, if you do need advice specific to your situation, you would want to seek out our, our registered investment advisor. And um, just FYI, if you need help finding someone there is a section on my website where I talk about that. It's also where you would find links to resources on other subjects that I talk about. Um, the, the URL for my website is in your handout. It'll be on the very last page, the last slide, but it's simply the name of my business, Karen Chan Financial Ed, short for education, Karen Chan Financial Ed.com. And on the resources tab, uh, you'll find uh, one that's called finding financial advice. And that will let you find assistance with that if you need it. All right, so to talk about understanding investments, I, I wanna start with a story. And it's a story about Frida starting her own business. Uh, she's starting a business called Frida's Fine Furniture. And now initially you may wonder what this has to do with understanding investing, but I think in about four or five minutes uh, that will become clear. So think about what someone starting a business needs. Now, yeah, they need a business plan. Um, yeah, they may need to find some space you know, for the business, but the bottom line is they need money, right? Money is what the, the main thing they're gonna be looking for to get their business off the ground. She needs money and she's figured out two ways to get the financing that she needs. First, she's gonna take on a partner. And you may notice my shark icon here. There may be some folks on tonight who are fans of Shark Tank. And what do they do on Shark Tank? People buy part of a business. So that's what we're talking about here, is that Frida is going to take a partner who will put in $100,000. And in exchange, they're going to own 25% of Frida's fine furniture. But Frida needs more dollars than that to get her business off the ground. And so she also takes a loan. She has an individual who will loan her another $100,000. They've agreed on a 6% interest rate. Uh, the loan is for 10 years, but it will be interest only payments until the end of the 10 years, at which time she will need to repay the entire $100,000. So let's see what happens with Frida and her company, Frida's Fine Furniture. Let's fast forward and look at 10 years from now. Frida has done really well. She happened to be in the right 
the right business area at the right time and or she had a great marketing plan and so forth that her business is now worth two million dollars and coincidentally here at the 10-year mark her partner her long-term partner has decided that she wants to sell uh her uh 25 percent of the business and so pretty easy math 25 percent of two million dollars is five hundred thousand dollars and so this now former partner walks away with $500,000, 400 of which are profit because they originally invested 100,000. Now that partner's feeling pretty good, but the lender is kind of looking sideways at the partner saying, "Hmm. Yeah, I loaned I loaned Frida $100,000. And over the last 10 years, I've gotten my interest payments as we agreed. 6% on $100,000 is $6,000. So the lender got $6,000 a year for 10 years, comes out to $60,000 total. Uh, and then at the end of the 10 years now, Frida repays the $100,000 that was loaned. And you might be wondering the same thing as the lender is, why does the lender only get $60,000 of interest where the partner increased their investment by $400,000. And you may have figured out that it's because of risk. And here's what we mean by risk. Let's rewind those 10 years and let's play scenario number two in which Frida's Fine Furniture really doesn't do very well. Actually, after five years, she's closing the business because the business is basically bankrupt. Um, it has total assets of $50,000. She has to use those 50,000, you know, she had, they had to use money to lay off the, the, uh, the employees, uh, you know, they sold off whatever furniture stock was left. They had to settle the lease, blah, blah, blah. And so it ends up that $50,000 is what's left after the business is closed. So the lender comes up and Frida says, okay, you know, I'm sorry, but $50,000 is all there is. So here's $50,000. So the lender had already gotten their interest payments. Frida was able to do that, but they ended up losing 50% of their investment. Now the partner comes up and says, what about me? Well, as you can see, the loans were larger than the remaining assets of the business. And so the business is bankrupt. The, the business is worth nothing. The partner owns 25%, but 25% of nothing is nothing. And so the partner in this case lost their entire investment. The fact of the matter is that whether you own something or whether you have loaned money, you face risks in both circumstances. We tend to understand the risks that face the owners better because we understand that a business might not do well. Maybe it's a business that's just not popular right now. It's not selling something that's wanted very much uh, by, the, by the consumer. Um, it's the wrong place in the business cycle, whatever. Um, we understand that. We also understand because we hear the news every day that the stock market as a whole goes up and down, our economy as a whole goes up and down, and, and that market risk sort of pulls the value of most businesses along with it. And so those are the two kinds of risk you face when you buy ownership in a business. There's a risk that the business itself or that particular industry might have trouble. There's also the risk that the economy and the stock market as a whole will have problems. Those are pretty easy to understand. The risks we face when we loan money though, um, there are more risks, but they're less obvious. The first risk is credit risk. And it's the risk that the business won't be able to repay what, they're, what they owe you. Let's look at, it, look at a, a similar example, but from the other side. Let's say that you're buying a car and you're trying to get a car loan in order to purchase your car. What is the seller going to do before they let you take the car? They're going to run a credit check. They may ask for income verification. Probably not nowadays, but um, they're going to try to make sure that you have the wherewithal 
and the willingness to repay your debts. Same thing here. Credit risk means that there are businesses who don't have the financial wherewithal to fulfill their obligations, and there is a risk of losing money because of that, like in our second scenario with Frida's Fine Furniture, where she could not fulfill her obligation to that lender for the full $100,000. But aside from that, there's also interest rate risk. When you loan money, you typically are loaning it at a fixed interest rate like our lender who was, who was told to expect 6%. Well, what if that lender after five years uh, decided that they, they needed the money, they, need, they wanted to find somebody to sell this IOU to, they wanted to resell this loan. And let's further assume that interest rates had gone up in the five years since this agreement had been done. Well, now, the other people who might be interested in buying this loan secondhand have choices. They could buy this loan, which is only paying 6% interest, or they could go loan some new company money and get 8%. When you're lending money, you want the higher interest rate. So that's what our lender uh, who wants to sell this loan uh, for free to find furniture is facing. In order to get somebody interested, they would have to decide to sell that loan for less than $100,000. That's interest rate risk. Their existing loan is now worth less because interest rates have gone up. Now, the reverse happens too. What if interest rates had dropped over these past five years? Then people would be lining up to buy this loan where they're going to get 6%. And in the end, they would drive the price up and our lender would walk away with something over $100,000. They would more than get their original investment back. The third risk that lenders face is called reinvestment rate risk. And this has to do with the idea that loans... Think CDs, for example. A CD is a way of lending money to a bank. You have an interest rate for a fixed period of time. Our lender has 6% interest for a 10-year period. At the end of 10 years, just like you would at the end of a CD, you, if, you, if you don't need that money, you're going to reinvest it. What interest rate are you going to be able to get when you reinvest it? Could be more, could be less. Um, like right now, if somebody has um, a, a, a loan that uh, is ending and they're, they're getting repaid and they're looking to, to invest their money, interest rates have gone up substantially in the last year. They're going to get a, a nice boost in the interest income they're going to get. The reverse was true through the 80s and 90s as interest rates dropped consistently uh, over that long time period. And then the final risk that lenders face is what we call purchasing power risk, meaning that while your money was invested, that um, what it could buy would be deteriorating because of inflation. So with our lender, they had $100,000 10 years ago. Let's say that at that point in time, they could, could have bought a nice little bungalow somewhere on the west side of Chicago. 10 years later, they're getting paid back their, their $100,000. And they're like, cool, I'm going to go buy that bungalow. But they go to look at that neighborhood and either the same house or a very similar house is on the market, but it's selling for $200,000. That's purchasing power risk. What they can buy now is a lot less than what they could have bought with the $100,000 10 years ago. And in this case, even after considering the interest that they were paid so that they would now have $160,000, it still didn't keep up with the inflation uh, that had happened during that time period. So when we think about our partner and our lender, we have to remember that just like with stocks, that partner was an owner if you own stock in a company, you're a shareholder, you're also an owner. And when you own something, there are two ways that you can, can make money. And here we're going to talk specifically about stocks. As an owner, you own a piece of this company, whether it's a percent as a partner or 
a share out of all the shares that are issued by the company. Eventually, you are probably going to sell that. You're hoping that you'll sell it at a profit, but you could sell it at a loss. That certainly happens. That happens, though, at the end of your ownership, that you sell that piece of the business. While you own it, though, you may be receiving dividends. Dividends are a way of companies sharing profits with their owners. Businesses have a couple of options of what they can do with the profits. They can plow it back into the company, hire more staff, build more locations, do more training, do more research and development, whatever. Or if they think that, that there's not that much more that they can do to increase sales or to increase market share, whatever, uh, by reinvesting the profits, they may say, well, let's make, our own, let's make our shareholders happy. Let's pay them a dividend. And dividends typically come each quarter over the course of the year. They are a certain amount per share. And people who own stock get accustomed to receiving these dividends and they like it. So although the original reason that a company might pay a dividend is because they have a profit uh, that they want to share with the owners, once a company starts issuing dividends, they will likely continue to pay dividends even if the company wasn't profitable that year because the owners will be upset if their dividends get, get cut or disappear. And they would probably start selling their shares of the company and the value of the entire company would drop. And so dividends are sometimes viewed as a way of kind of measuring you know, how well a company is doing, but they're not a perfect measure. Uh, because companies who do extremely well may or may not pay dividends. The classic example of that is Microsoft was profitable for years. At this point, I can say decades um, before it ever paid a dividend. They, for the first many years in business, took all those profits and plowed them back into the business, building more product, uh, more market share, uh, more R&D to keep them competitive over other products. And it was only literally after decades in business, that they paid their first dividend. It wasn't because they hadn't been profitable. They had been, but they finally reached a point where they saw more benefit to the company to pay out the dividend than to keep it in-house. So when we talk about stocks and we talk about being a shareholder, we have to talk about the kinds of companies that you might invest in. And so Stocks are uh, classified in a few different ways. Um, we can first look at company size. This is a very common way uh, for us to compare companies. You've heard the terms, I'm sure, small cap, mid cap, large cap. It refers to the capitalization, the value of the company. Small cap stocks are sometimes companies you haven't heard of um, or they're regional companies. Uh, large caps tend to be ones that everybody recognizes, uh, like everybody would probably recognize um, Abbott Labs, uh, GE. Um, I think GM is still a large cap stock that was in question, I think, for a while. Uh, but these are typically big names like Walmart, uh, big retailers. Um, mid cap, one example I used to use, I presume there's still a mid cap stock, is one that most of us recognize. But you can see that the amount of business they do is small compared to the others I've been talking about. And this is Cracker Barrel. We see Cracker Barrels up and down the interstates when we travel. There are lots of them, uh, but they're relatively small individually. And together, they have a lot of business, but nothing compared to the big retailers like Amazon, uh, Walmart, and so forth. Another way to categorize companies is by geographic location. Is the company based in the US or are they based in Europe? Are they based in the Pacific? Are they based somewhere else? And sort of a variation on that theme is the, um, the uh, development state of the economy in that country. And we generally, in, in terms of uh, classifying stocks, we talk about developed markets and emerging markets. Emerging markets where the stock market is not quite as Stable, maybe not quite, uh, the economy not quite as well regulated, 
and emerging markets are viewed as being potentially paying higher return, but higher return in investing virtually always means because there's higher risk involved. And then sort of the investment philosophy that the stock might appeal to. Value investing is where a, a person or an or a, an investment company tries to pick out companies who, for whatever reason, aren't valued very highly right now. Maybe they've had a couple of bad uh, quarters of returns, or maybe there's something viewed as being a tailwind that they're going to have to fight. I mean, a headwind that they're going to have to fight. Um, on the other hand, other stocks are purchased because they are viewed as being growth stocks. They have a lot of growth potential. Uh, not quite so concerned about the um, the, whether the current value is accurate for the company, but just knowing that their market share is increasing, they're very aggressive, um, they, they, we think they have great prospects going forward. And so when you hear value investing and growth investing, we're talking about sort of a different philosophy, a different approach uh, to trying to find good returns with your investments. So to recap, remember that our partner that put the $100,000 into Frida's Fine Furniture, they were an owner, just as you might be an owner, a part owner of a company because you own stock or because you have money in a mutual fund that owns stock. And if so, all these things we've been talking about apply to you. The same risks that our owner face, the business risk and the market risk, um, and now talking about companies uh, you know, across the U.S. or across the world, we have different ways of slicing and dicing to talk about the different types of stocks that we might buy. So now let's kind of flip and talk about lenders who, when we're talking about lending money to companies or to uh, government entities, we're talking about bonds. If you own a bond, a bond is an IOU. And so if you own a bond, you have actually loaned somebody money. If you own an Arlington Heights Memorial Library bond, I don't actually know whether the library has issued bonds in recent years or not, but if they're out there, it means that the library is has borrowed money from you. And when, uh, and when they pay it back, they'll be paying you as the bondholder. Um, similarly, you know, if... Um, uh, let's say that Macy's uh, wants to raise money or whoever the parent company of Macy's is. They might sell bonds and, and somebody who buys a bond is lending money to that company. So what happens when you're a lender, when you are a, uh, a bondholder? Um, you have the possibility of making money in two ways as well. The main way that most people who own bonds are expecting to make money is through those interest payments. Now, from around the year 2000 up until 2022, interest rates have been at historic lows. And so even though, yes, you were making a little bit of interest as, as a lender, you know, as a bondholder or as someone who owned a CD, uh, which means you loaned money to the bank, um, your interest was relatively small. We're now seeing people get a little more interested in being lenders because interest rates have gone from like half a percent uh, on uh, bank savings products to now where you could make over 4%, you know, if you shop around. Uh, bonds have seen similar changes in interest rates. But there is a second way that lenders and, and bondholders can make money. And that is that when the, now if they hold it until the bond matures, like what our, our lender to Frida's Fine Furniture did in scenario number one, they get their investment back. There is no profit and no loss there. It's just a repayment of principal. But as I mentioned, if they sell before maturity, maybe because they see a better opportunity somewhere or because they need the money, whatever, they are going to experience either a gain or a loss depending on what the current interest rates are compared to the interest rate that their bond or their CD or what have you is, is, uh, is earning. And so, like I said, the main way that bondholders uh, or lenders make money is through interest, but there can be the potential to make money if interest rates drop and the loan that you hold becomes more valuable because it's paying a higher interest rate. And just like with stocks, we classify bonds in different ways too. 
First, we categorize them by who issued the bond, meaning who was doing the borrowing. It could be a corporate entity. It could be the federal government. You hear about treasury bills and bonds. You hear about savings bonds. Those are all ways that the federal government is borrowing money from people. We have government agencies uh, and municipalities uh, that sell bonds. Other ways um, to categorize bonds are by their financial rating. Remember I told you that um, one of the things about being a lender is one of the risks you face is credit risk. Well, these financial ratings are an attempt to, to categorize the amount of credit risk that they face. Just like you probably have a credit score, and that's an attempt to label you in terms of how likely you are to fulfill your obligations on a loan. That's what the, these financial ratings are supposed to do for companies too. And the companies that fall in the category where they are really expected to be able to pay back their interest as well as the principal when it's due, those are known as investment grade bonds. The ones that are not, you'll see them marketed with the label high yield, but you'll also hear them labeled as junk bonds. So high yield is sort of a euphemism. You know, it's a kinder way of saying, we're not too sure whether this company is going to be able to repay their debts or not. And so, yeah, you're welcome to buy their bonds, but you're taking a higher risk of not getting your money than if you invested in investment grade bonds. And then finally, something that's a little more sophisticated is bonds are classified by their duration. It's a little more complex, but it's related to what is the time to maturity for this bond? Is the bond supposed to be paid off in one year or two years or 10 years or 30 years? But also, what is the yield? Of, it's, it's related to the interest rate. What is the interest rate that's currently being paid on that bond? And what is the time to maturity? And between those two factors, you come up with this thing called duration. The longer the duration, the more the value of this bond would be affected by changes in interest rates. The shorter the duration, the less changes in current interest rates will affect the value of that bond. So at this point, try to give you a pretty good overview of starting with that story about our business trying to help you have a basic understanding of what it means to be an owner, a part owner of a company, either as a partner or the way most of us do it, as a, part, as a stockholder, shareholder, but also the other major type of investment that people use, which is lending money, typically by owning bonds, um, but very similar to that is using savings vehicles like CDs and other types of savings accounts. Um, but ironically, that's not the way that most of us invest nowadays. Most of us don't buy individual stocks and we don't buy individual bonds, even more rarely, because you don't have to. And you don't even have to have a lot of money to invest, thanks to this thing called a mutual fund. So let's talk about mutual funds. First, you know, how do they work? Well, they are, they're investment companies. And what they do is they pool money from a number of different investors together to make a fund, a mutual fund. Mutual meaning that each person who put money in has ownership and owns a certain proportion of that fund. Mutual funds are liquid. Liquidity means that you can get your money out of it easily without without friction without fees typically. And they're liquid because investors can sell their shares back to the investment company, back to the mutual fund at any time. They don't have to go find another buyer to buy their part. And by definition, mutual funds are not investing in one company. They are diversified, typically across a large number of companies. Some things, though, are unique about mutual funds. First of all, if you purchase 
shares in a mutual fund or you sell shares in a mutual fund, you might enter your order at any time during the day today. But those orders will all be processed at the exact same moment at the end of the trading day. So, you know, with an individual stock or an individual bond, you know, you can check, you know, from moment to moment, from hour to hour and see the direction of the price over the course of the day. And you decide when to pull the trigger. You decide at what point uh, to actually make that purchase or to make that sale. Mutual funds take some of that shooting from the hip um, uh, thing. They, they remove that. You can't choose that precisely. You say, I want to buy this thing. And what you end up paying for it is whatever its value is at the end of the day, whatever the closing prices are. And that's um, that's what determines the value of the mutual fund, the prices of the individual investments inside. It's called a net asset value. Uh, and so it's not based on how much people want to buy of this mutual fund. It's based on the actual selling prices of the stocks or the bonds or other investments that are inside the fund. Those stocks or bonds inside the fund may well be paying interest or paying dividends. And inside the mutual fund, they may be buying and selling investments. And so there could be gains or losses inside the fund. Those, those incomes will be will be uh, reported as income to the shareholder. So even though you might own shares in a mutual fund and you didn't sell any of your shares, you could still get a 1099 at the end of the year that represents how much interest was generated in your part of the mutual fund, how many, how many dividends were paid to your shares of the mutual fund, and any gains that were sold, uh, that were obtained when they sold something that was in your part of the mutual fund. You didn't actually get the money, but, well, you could have actually gotten the money. You could have it set up so that anytime that happens, you actually get a check or get a deposit to your checking account. Most people have those things reinvested in the fund. And so you're getting the benefit of those, but you may not have actually gotten it out in cash. You might have gotten it in the form of more shares in your mutual fund. Some people are caught off guard by this. And they're offended by the idea that they have taxable income when they didn't take cash in hand. So this is something just to understand up front about how these things work. And so what are the costs of mutual funds? Well, it does cost money to operate a fund. You have to pay staff. You probably have some sort of office space. You have phone lines. You have research uh, charges, whatever. These operating costs are measured by a standardized concept called the expense ratio. This is the annual cost of ownership, and it'll be expressed as a percent. Um, for example, you might see some mutual funds that let's say that their expense ratio is 0.7% per year. That means that each year, let's say you had um, let me do some quick math here. I should have a written example down for you. Um, for every $100 that you have in the fund, it will cost you 70 cents. 70 cents uh, will be the operating costs for you to own that $100 worth. Um, and so for $1,000, for $10,000, you're still going to pay that same seven-tenths of a percent. And it's an annual thing. But there are other fees that you could encounter as well. This depends on the specific mutual fund that you chose. Um, funds that are sold by salespeople typically have what are called loads. They're not called commissions, but if you understand the concept of commission, it's a way of paying a salesperson. That's what loads on mutual funds are as well. And so when you own a mutual fund, there may be either loads that are paid on the front end or on the back end when you sell or are, are over a period of years. Um, however, there are what we call no load funds. These are ones that are typically sold either by the mutual fund itself um, where there is no commission, there is no load, uh, there's no sales fee paid uh, to anybody for marketing them. You could also run into other, fun, other fees, um, Funds that invest in investments that are um, 
more labor intensive to manage, um, harder to find good liquidity on. You might uh, invest in a fund that says, you know, we actually have a small fee for the initial purchase of your shares. Or if you sell too soon, uh, within within too short of a time, we may charge you a redemption fee. Um, and there could be, if you only have a small amount invested, there might be account management fees. Once you get above a certain level, those account management fees will typically disappear. So we've been talking about this concept of mutual funds. Um, let me try to give you some examples. Now, this is not uh, this is not recommendations. This is just trying to help you think concretely about what these mutual funds are. So on the left here, I have the names of several investment companies who offer mutual funds. And on the right-hand side, I've given you the name of a specific mutual fund operated by that company. So for example, American Funds is a very large mutual fund company. Uh, one of their popular funds is called the Bond Fund of America. Very clear what it's investing in, right? Vanguard and Fidelity are also very large mutual fund companies in the U.S. Vanguard is perhaps best known for its Vanguard Index 500 fund, and we'll talk more about indexes in just a moment. You know, Fidelity, again, a, a particular uh, fund. Now, Oakmark is kind of unique because I think they only uh, offer one um one mutual fund, and it's obviously, you know, uh, named after the, the company itself. So just trying to give you some, some concrete uh, things that might uh, ring a bell with you that you will recognize. Yeah, I've heard that talked about. Now, just as we talked about ways to categorize stocks and ways to categorize bonds, mutual funds, to a large extent, do the, follow those same kinds of categories. So within mutual funds, you'll find mutual funds that are, are uh, holding only large cap stocks or mid cap stocks or small cap stocks. You'll find mutual funds that invest only in international funds or international companies or some that will invest globally. You may think that sounds like the same thing. Global simply means it includes the United States, whereas international refers to companies who are based outside the United States exclusively. We talked about emerging markets versus developed markets. Um, another category of mutual funds you might see could be called something like specialty or select. These are mutual funds that aren't quite doing the usual thing. I told you that mutual funds are diversified. And, um, and that is typically the case. But sometimes uh, companies will put together a mutual fund that is only somewhat diversified. For example, somebody will put together a mutual fund that only invests in one country or a mutual fund that only invests in one, um, one sort of industry within the United States, like pharmaceuticals or um, aerospace or IT. And so those mutual funds are a little different. Uh, they aren't giving you the diversification that you typically get with them. Now move over here to the yellow box where I've got our lending symbol here. And we've got <clears throat> two general types of uh, funds that you will see here. The first ones are called money markets. These are, these are lending funds. I mean, they would fall under the same general category as bonds. But money market funds are making very short-term loans to very high-quality businesses. And so they're viewed as being almost risk-free. Um, you can treat them almost like a money market account at the bank. I say almost because they are, the funds are not insured. But the accounts at the bank are. Uh, and then we have, of course, the bond funds who you might see a fund that's uh, incorporating many of these. But typically, bond funds are focusing either on corporate or federal government, or municipal, or high yield. Most funds um, uh, uh, don't buy across the whole board here. Did you notice this green box in the middle? We didn't have these labels when we talked about stocks and bonds, and that's because these labels are for stock are for mutual funds that are blending. That's why they're green. You know, I'm blending blue and yellow. Um, these green mutual funds, uh, in terms of color, not talking about the environment, um, are, are a blend. 
They hold both stocks and bonds and probably some mutual funds. And you may see them labeled as target date funds, target date retirement funds, uh, specifically in your um, 401k, life cycle funds or asset allocation funds or balanced. Any of those phrases uh, will indicate that this is a mutual fund that isn't just a stock fund or just a bond fund. They're doing a combination. And in many cases, uh, especially in the target date and the life cycle funds, they're trying to do it in a way that's appropriate for somebody at a specific stage of life. Uh, target date funds, for example, you'll typically choose a fund that has a year in its name, 2025, 2030, 2040, 2055. Um, that's telling you that that fund is appropriate for somebody who's going to retire around that point in time. Because as we get closer to retirement, typically we want to be more conservative. We want to be slanting more toward bonds and less toward stocks. And so the fact that they are a combination of stocks and bonds is the first thing to know. And the second is to know how do they decide what that ratio is? And is it something that changes over time as you get closer to retirement? Or is it, in the case of an asset allocation fund, something that's pretty much fixed? You know, maybe they're almost always 60% um, stocks and 40% bonds, and it's not going to change. And that would be for a different purpose uh, than a fund that is going to carry you uh, to retirement and beyond. Another way that we distinguish mutual funds is by their management style which has an impact on the cost. We have actively managed funds, which are, to be honest, the easier ones to understand. And this is what the original mutual funds were. With an actively managed mutual fund, you have a manager who is actively deciding which stocks or which bonds to buy, which ones to sell, which ones to hang on to. So you've got somebody who's picking and choosing what to buy and sell. The average annual expense ratio, there's that phrase again, the average annual expense ratio for actively managed funds is about 0.7%, 7 tenths of a percent for equity funds, meaning mutual funds that invest in stocks. And it's about 0.5% for funds that invest in bonds. So actively managed is one way of managing a mutual fund. The other way is passive investing. And these are called index funds because they passively track an index that, that measures the performance of a part or all of the stock market or the bond market. These are much less labor intensive to operate and therefore they have significantly lower costs. Annual expense ratios on index funds on average right now are only six one hundredths of a percent. And you can tell that's one tenth of the cost of owning an actively managed fund, at least looking at the average cost. And um, the, the uh, average annual expense ratio for index funds is the same for equity funds and for bond funds both at six one hundredths of a percent. Put that in perspective, now we're talking about six cents a year is your cost to own that same $100 uh, in a mutual fund. Well, let's talk a little bit more about this concept of indexing. At some point along the way, people began to notice that <clears throat> how companies performed compared to the rest of the economy uh, was to a certain extent driven by what kind of company they were. Were they a small kind of startup company? Were they a large established company who, who stereotypically are viewed as being a little bit more lumbering, a little bit harder to change course and adapt to new uh, situations? Each of these asset classes, um, uh, research has shown, they do behave somewhat differently. Small cap stocks tend to rally faster after a recession. They also may tend to fall faster uh, at the beginning of, of one. But the next step after somebody recognized this was they created indexes to track the performance of these different groups of assets. So there are indexes like the Russell 2000 
that track the performance of small cap stocks. And I already referenced earlier the Standard & Poor's 500, uh, one of the original indexes for tracking uh, large cap stock performance in the United States. So then the next step of progression here was we recognize that these different categories of assets perform differently. Somebody created indexes to be able to track and report their performance. And then somebody said, hey, let's create a mutual fund that will track one of those indexes. And there we have index mutual funds, which are not trying to beat the market. They are literally trying to be the market. If it's an, a small cap index fund, its goal is simply going to be to do as well as small cap stocks do. If it's a large cap mutual fund, their goal is to have investment performance that matches what large cap funds across the board together are doing. And it's, um, it's kind of ironic. Most of us are familiar with the idea of being competitive. We want to do better than the average. Ironically, in the world of investing, indexing, which is really trying to be average, typically turns out to give you the best results. Research has documented this time and time again. So now, leaving index mutual funds, let's talk about another category of funds that I mentioned to you already. And these are the target date retirement funds I mentioned. These are mutual funds that inside, typically are investing in several mutual funds a large cap stock mutual fund, perhaps, a small cap stock mutual fund, a bond fund, an international fund, uh, perhaps a money market fund in there. So target date retirement funds are a little bit more complex in the fact that inside, they don't just have individual stocks and bonds, they actually have individual mutual funds in there. Some of them use index funds to make up their target date retirement funds. Uh, Vanguard has done that for quite a while, and I think um, I made a note of this somewhere, but I didn't add it in here. Fidelity, I believe, is the one who has come out with its own series of target date funds who are also using their index funds inside as opposed to actively managed. And the way you choose a target date retirement fund is, as I mentioned, there'll be a series of funds offered. There'll be just the plain old target date fund. That's probably for people at retirement age or beyond. Then you'll have the ones that have the year, 2025, 2030, and so forth. And the typical way of selecting a fund is you say, oh, about when am I going to retire? Or about when am I going to be 60 or 65 years old? Choose the fund that's closest to that point in time. The fund will allocate money between stocks, bonds, and cash based on the number of years to your retirement or once you're actually in retirement. You do not have to get out of this fund because you retire. It will, it will simply start to maintain its ratio of stocks and bonds from that point on. But between, let's say, if you're 35 uh, uh, in, the, in the working world and you're going to work for another 30 years and then you're going to be probably alive for a good 30 years after that, as the mutual, as you age and as the mutual fund gets closer to that date that's in its name, it will begin to shift. It will begin to um, invest slightly less in stocks, slightly more in bonds, adding slightly more cash. And it's the glide, it's called a glide path, the the um the arc that it follows. And then eventually it reaches a point where it doesn't change anymore around the time you reach retirement. Um, Different companies, different investment companies, target date funds have different glide paths. Um, all target date funds do not have the same ratio of stocks and bonds, even though they may have the same year's name in them. But they're all intended to be as close as you can get to set it and forget it when it comes to investing. Okay, one more thing about types of funds. Now, technically, these are not mutual funds but they are based on the idea of mutual funds. You'll hear these referred to as ETFs. That stands for Exchange Traded Funds. They differ from mutual funds in a couple of ways, but the similarities, uh, the similar, there are numerous similarities. First, that they don't own just one stock or one bond. They're typically well-diversified. 
But the way they differ from mutual funds is you buy or sell them at, at, at any point during the trading day. They're not settled at the end of the day the way mutual funds are. That means that you will know exactly what you're going to pay or sell for uh, when you issue the order. The other thing that's different is when you sell, you are not selling your share back to the mutual to a mutual fund company. You are selling it to some other buyer who is there watching the market at the same time you are and placing an order to buy what you are selling. Um, that means that there may be uh, commissions that will need to be paid to a broker uh, on these trades. It also means that the price you buy for or the price you sell at may or may not exactly match up with the value of what is inside the, the fund, because here prices are driven by supply and demand. With mutual funds, it's based on the supply and demand for the individual stocks and bonds inside the fund, not for the mutual fund itself. And so that is um, an additional small risk that is borne uh, when you invest in exchange traded funds. Um, but one of the advantages is they are viewed as more tax efficient because with exchange traded funds, you typically pay no taxes on gains until you actually sell your shares. You would still have the issue with um, uh, with interest and dividends. That's still going to be taxable income to you. It's probably going to be paid out to you. Um, but any gains you would not owe tax on until you actually sell your shares. Originally, virtually all ETFs were index funds, just like what we talked about with mutual funds, tracking an index. But this is changing. And so now if you're if you're looking at ETFs, you have one of the questions you need to ask is, is this an actively managed ETF, meaning that you're depending on the manager to be making good decisions about what to buy and what to sell? Or is it an index fund where you would expect that that fund is going to perform very similarly to the index that it's trying to track? Because most ETFs um, are index funds, they are inexpensive, and they actually are slightly less expensive even than the index mutual funds. Currently, annual fees are running at three one hundredths of a percent or less. So let's let's move from understanding investments themselves <clears throat> to talk a bit about how and where to invest. You could go to a broker or a mutual fund company or the investment arm that's operated by your bank uh, and set up an investment account. We're going to call those taxable accounts. You could also set up retirement plans, retirement accounts. The, the way most of us get these is through our employers. Your employer may offer a 401k if it's a for-profit company. If you're working in government or nonprofit, you might be offered a 403b or a 457 plan. You could also set up your own, uh, an IRA, that you could uh, open at any of these financial institutions I've already mentioned. If you're self-employed, then you have a whole nother set uh, of types of self-employed retirement plans that you could set up. But within the um, retirement plan group, there are two tax, tax treatments that you will encounter. The, the traditional one is the tax deferred account, where the money that you put into the retirement account is not taxed this year. That portion of your income avoids tax for now. But you would be deferring the tax until later on, presumably in retirement, when you will take the money out and pay tax on it then. But the other newer type of retirement plan is the Roth account. Putting money into a Roth account does not give you any tax advantage now. If you choose, for example, the Roth version of your 401k at work and put money into it, you will still pay tax on that part of your income this year. But the tax benefit you will reap is tax-free growth down the road when you take the money out. Now, I'm not going to spend time going over this because it's not really the focus of tonight's program. But in case this is new to you, I've got some of the details about IRAs and employer plans mapped out here for you to help you understand a little bit about how they work. There are a lot of similarities. There are a few differences between employer plans and IRAs. 
So, so let's talk about the way that most of us end up making our first investment choices. And it typically happens at the first job you have that has benefits. Uh, and I've got Julie here, uh, who's just approached that point in life. And um, she's she actually went to work at Free Design Furniture. Uh, they have a 401k plan. And her investment choices within her 401k, two high-level choices, she could put her money in Free Design Furniture stock. Frida's Fine Furniture is now a stock that trades on the stock market. And so Frida could put her money in that. But she also has this long list of mutual funds grouped according to those categories that we already encountered. And Julie is trying to figure out what to do. Well, one option is that, well, actually, there's an option before this. One option is that she puts her money in Frida's Fine Furniture stock. There's an old saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If Julie does that, it means that she's putting her retirement future at, at risk to the same thing that her employment is at risk to. If Frida's fine furniture doesn't do well, not only would Julie lose her job, but her retirement savings could also evaporate as well. So general rule of thumb, you do not invest your retirement money with your company's stock, you choose other investments. So in that case, now we're at option, the real option one, Julie's trying to decide, maybe she's gonna pick some individual funds. She came to the class tonight, she kind of understands what those categories mean. Um, but now she's realizing that before she can pick mutual funds, she has to figure out about this thing called risk tolerance or risk capacity, like how much should she have in stocks and how much should she have in bonds? How long will it be before she's going to access these funds? What does that say about what an appropriate asset allocation is for her? Is your head hurting yet? Um, you know, she looks at the list and she starts to kind of cross out some things she thinks aren't relevant. There's still a lot of funds on this list. Um, and so she has to understand which asset class are each of these funds in, and are they going to stay like that? Some mutual funds change their characteristics over time. Which ones are actively managed and passively managed, and how does she feel about that? How much do they each cost? Um, how's the performance of each of them been over time? Who's the manager, and, and how's their performance? And going forward, she would have to make the decisions about is there a time when she decides that she doesn't want to be invested in one of these mutual funds anymore? She wants to move to something else. Um, what about if stocks do really well and bonds don't, and now she ends up owning a lot more in stocks than she does in bonds? She'll have to do some rebalancing to get that back to where she thinks is the appropriate asset allocation for her. She'll also have to think about as she ages, how much more conservative does she need to be? There's a lot of responsibility here. She's kind of getting worried. So she's glad to hear that there are a couple more options. Option number two is that she looks for the index funds that are probably offered here. She's going to look for four index funds to cover four major asset classes. She's going to look for one bond fund that covers U.S. bonds. Under stocks, she can look for a large cap fund one that covers perhaps both mid and small cap and an international fund. And she's covered all the bases that she needs to. This will give her low cost because they're index funds. She'll have broad diversification because they are matching the market. They're not choosing some small subset of it. And there'll be no need to worry about manager changes because it's not a manager who's making the decisions. These are passive funds. They are simply tracking the performance of an index. Therefore, if it's a small company stock fund now, it will always be a small company stock fund going forward. She won't have to worry about those kinds of changes. And again, just to give you some, um, some concrete examples here, here are the four asset classes that we said Julie is going to be buying funds in. And here are some of the kinds of funds, some of the specific funds that she might see listed that represent those uh, different asset classes, those categories. And these are the actual indices 
that those particular funds are following. Um, now, if she goes this route, Julie still has some responsibilities. Uh, when one asset class performs really well compared to another one, she'll still need to do rebalancing. Um, although in retirement plans, some providers, some custodians will actually um, do rebalancing automatically for you if you set that up. But she will still be the one responsible for deciding how her asset allocation should change as she ages. So she likes this better, but she's wondering if there's something that's even simpler. And so finally, we're at option number three, which is Julie could choose just one fund. It's a fund that invests in other funds. It's one whose initial asset allocation is based on the number of years you are from retirement. It will rebalance automatically and it will have a glide path that shifts it to be more conservative, meaning more bonds and more cash, fewer stocks as you age. What did we say those were called? Either a target date fund or they might be called the life cycle fund. And at this point, every retirement plan is required to offer target date retirement funds. And so now Julie is starting to feel relieved. She's realizing that while target date retirement funds may not be perfect in everybody's book, they are certainly simple. And she knows that she's not going to have to be worrying about this every few months or every year about what action she should be taking. And so that is investing made simple. So that's the conclusion of the formal presentation tonight. If you haven't been putting your questions in chat, um, please be doing that. Um, and like I said, if there are things related to investing or other topics that I teach about, you can find um, resources on my website, karenchanfinancialed.com, under the resources tab by picking the name of the topic that you want to learn more about. Um, and if you want to know more about uh, where I'm presenting at other libraries, you'll also find uh, that list on there as well. And I see Barbara is back uh, on video with us. So that means she's ready to take a look at the chat and see what we've got in terms of questions. I do not have any questions yet. So if anyone out there is has is wondering anything or has questions, you know, now's the time to type them in there. Um, oh, um, maybe you saw this already and dealt with it, Barbara. There's a couple of comments in the Q&A that chat oh. is disabled. Oh, oh, that's funny. Huh. All right, hold on. Let me see if I can. And, it, and if chat is disabled, maybe people just want to use the Q&A. Yeah, that would be fine, too. Let's see if that's really... Oh, interesting. Attendees can chat with no one. Okay, the chat is now enabled. Sorry about that. I don't know why that would be. But yes, I see the Q&A so we can get started with that. Um, sorry about that, that the chat was disabled. I did not realize that that was even an option. Um, so it's it should be good now. Um, yeah. We were just chatting at the before. beginning. Yeah, we were just yeah. chatting at the beginning about how Zoom tends to change things from time to time. And actually, Barbara, this is the second time that I have uh, noticed that that this has happened, where chat has been disabled. No yeah. idea uh, why why they would do that. Yeah. Um, so someone did ask, are the slides available? I, I did put the handout in the link in the chat so you can click that and get the handout. Um, it was also in the email that you received with the, the Zoom link for tonight. Um, I'm not sure about the slides. It, the, the handout is a copy of the slides. Okay. Yeah, right. It's just in a handout format. So you won't use up you know, a whole forest uh, if you decide to print it out. Yeah, I did look at it, but I guess I didn't make the connection. So, um, all right, so that's good. Um, it was, this talk was recorded, still being recorded. Uh, it, I'm not exactly sure when it will become available, but uh, you will get an email once it is available. All right, and someone's asking, do you know which index indexes the TSP invests in? Um, yes, actually. Um, 
I used to I used to mention this, and I was trying to um, cut down on time, and took it out. Um, these categories that I used here, this is actually based on how the TSP is set up. These are the categories of index funds that the uh, Thrift Savings Plan offered to federal employees has been using for quite some time. I believe that they are now also using uh, target date retirement funds, like what we talked about. So you also have those options in TSP. And I want to say that they recently added some other choices as well. Personally, I was disappointed to hear that because I, I felt like of all the retirement plans out there, when TSP made the uh, decision to offer only index funds, um, I thought they were really setting a good model. They were looking after their employees very well when they did that. Um, so I know that they they do still offer uh, these four basic. Uh, I can't tell you for sure what the um, what the names uh, of the funds are, uh, but they cover these four asset classes. I want to. I may have some of these may actually be the funds that are offered uh, in the TSP. I can't recall, but this is the structure there. And if you want to know more about that, um, uh, you can uh, send me a, a message via um, via my my website. There's a contact Karen tab there. Um, but I think uh, I think now that you've been through tonight's class, I think the offerings uh, in the TSP should be pretty self-explanatory to you. Okay, there uh, is another question. Any advice for starting an investment for a child? Okay, um, I won't advise whether you should or should not, but I'll give you some ideas if you choose to do it, a couple of different ways you can go about it. Um, one way is to invest in uh, an account that would be specifically toward uh, education expenses. And that would be either uh, an education savings account or a 529 plan. 529 plans are offered by all states. Uh, Illinois' 529 plan is pretty well respected. It uses index funds, it has low costs. Um, and you would be able to either choose funds or um, sort of like the target date retirement funds, you would be able to invest in something that is based on the child's age and the number of years before they would use it. Now, if higher education isn't necessarily your concern here, um, then you could use something called an UTMA account, Uniform Transfer to Minors account. Um, it's a way of putting money that has the child designated, and I'm sorry, it's been a long time since I've studied these, um, I know that the parent still has control over it, so I, I can't remember exactly how it works. The child is somehow named as beneficiary, and at age 18, they actually become the owner of it. And so one of the downsides of the UTMA accounts, UTMA accounts, is that once the child reaches the age of majority, um, you have zero control. Uh, the child can do whatever they choose. Now, with some kids, that's not going to be a problem, and other parents are going to be worried about that. Um, the only other option I can think of, uh, I mean, you could set up a brokerage account, but technically that's not going to work because a minor cannot legally, uh, legally they can't own anything. Um, so another option might be um, if they have any earned income, maybe we're talking about a high school kid, you might fund uh, an IRA uh, to the extent that they have earned income. Uh, to get them started on retirement savings. So those are the options that I typically hear mentioned when you're trying to help a kid get started building up some sort of assets. Okay, next question. Is Amazon a good stock to buy? The company does not pay dividends. Um, well, as we discussed, whether or not a company pays dividends isn't really an indicator of whether the company is profitable or a good investment or not. Um, but I, I don't make recommendations about stocks. Uh, actually, I don't necessarily recommend that people invest in individual stocks. Um, it may not be obvious, but investing in individual stocks is riskier than investing in a diversified mutual fund. But this is a point where I'll, I'll define risk when we're talking about investing. Risk is technically the range of possible outcomes that you could have. By investing in one particular company, 
you might choose the, the one best one in the world and you'll have just phenomenal returns over a period of a year or several years. On the other hand, you could pick the one that my husband picked when he kind of tried his hand at buying individual stocks back around 1999. And his experience was the exact opposite. It went to zero. He lost the money. Um, that's the range of possibilities when you invest in one company. Investing in a diversified portfolio means that, yeah, you are not as likely to shoot the lights out, but you're also less likely to lose your shirt. And, um, and so diversification does offer uh, an improvement uh, risk-wise from investing with an individual stock. But as far as Amazon's uh, appeal as an investment, I simply can't comment. Okay, next question. What is the platform to start investing? Um, if I'm not sure what you mean by platform, um, if we're talking about employer plans, um, you're, you're talking about whatever your employer has chosen. They will have chosen a financial custodian. Um, it could be, uh, some of the companies that we know as, as mutual fund companies that also serve as managers. It might be a company like Empower, which is really, uh, their business is managing retirement plans uh, for employers. Um, if you're talking about setting up an investment account on your own, um, you could be talking about going to um, a broker like uh, TD Ameritrade or Schwab. Um, you might be talking about going to what we generally think of as being mutual fund companies, but they also do offer general investment accounts. If you don't want to limit yourself to their mutual funds, you can do that through probably any of them, you know, Fidelity, Vanguard, T. Rowe Price, American Funds, whoever. Um, your, your bank, um, many banks today have a brokerage arm. It's not actually part of the bank. And it's not, and I say it's not part of the bank because investment accounts that you might do through an arm of your bank are not bank accounts and are not insured the way your bank accounts are. But those are the 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 venues, the 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 ways through which you would typically find a financial institution uh, to invest in. And if that's not the question you were asking, feel free to come back and uh, and comment about that. Uh, next question: Could you discuss PE ratio when considering a stock? Well, PE stands for um, uh, probably, mm, I can't even, I, I'm sorry. Since I do not invest in individual stocks and I don't talk about investing in individual stocks, I all I, all I will say is that is one of the tools that is used in sometimes evaluating the value of, the, of a company at its current selling price. Um, price earnings, maybe? Yes, it is. It's price to earnings. Um, and so it's saying, how much would you pay, be, how many dollars would you be paying for each dollar of earnings that you expect to get? Price to earnings ratios can either be looking backward or they can be projections looking forward. Um, they are not a guaranteed way of predicting the performance of a company. Um, if we had a guaranteed way of predicting performance of a company, then we, we'd all be millionaires. Um, but it is a tool that is commonly used by investors looking to choose individual stocks. It, um, but um, I'll just stop there because that's the factual information and anything beyond gets into advice about how to choose stocks, which I don't do. All right. Next question. Any idea what percent of employers match 401k contributions? It's been a while since I have seen that number. Um, I know it's substantial, uh, but I don't know what the exact percentage is. And also how they match uh, is, is different as well. Some might match dollar for dollar up to, let's say, 3% of your income. Others might match 50% on the dollar. And so there's a range um, uh, that they might do. But I'm going to say that the majority of employers, employers, I believe, who offer 401ks do offer some form of a match. Okay. Um, let's see. Sorry about that. Uh, 
like it looks like well someone commented some encourage you to use an insurance policy i guess i'm not 100 percent. i don't know what that applies to, I, but. I bet they're referring back to the question about um how to um start uh trying to build assets for a child okay. um that that is an approach that um that can be used um, it typically doesn't give you the same kind of return you would see by investing outright. Um, it's uh, the way they used to be structured, and I suppose they're structured the same way. It's basically a life insurance policy that sort of matures at the time your kid reaches age 18 or something like that. And um, it's it's in essence a cash value policy where Part of the money that you pay into it goes toward the actual cost of insurance, um, meaning covering the, the cost of the, based on the possibility, the probability that whether a child will live, will live or die up to the age of 18. And then the remainder would actually get in, be put in some sort of an investment account. Because it's not a pure investment, because there are insurance costs built into that, uh, typically those are not going to be um, as good of an investment in the long term than actually putting money into some sort of investment account. But yeah, insurance companies have always had uh, some sort of product that they've marketed toward that. They sometimes have been marketed as a way of building uh, funds for college. Um, but if you uh, talk to someone other than an insurance salesperson uh, to do some cost comparisons for you, you'll probably end up going with more of a straight investment. Okay, another question. Oops, where did it go? Oh, what do you think of all of the apps for investing, such as Robinhood? Um, okay. On the positive side, many of them have low or no costs. That's kind of how Robinhood made its um, made its reputation. They certainly make investing easily accessible. The, the concerns I have about them are some of them are heavy on promoting investing in cryptocurrency, which you notice you haven't heard much about uh, since the huge bankruptcy uh, that happened a few months ago. Um, but that was one of my concerns about some of the apps um, and not just investing apps, but apps like Cash App that's really a digital wallet one of the things that it advertised as a positive was that you could invest in cryptocurrency through them. I'm sorry, if we're talking about trying to manage your money and be able to use money to pay people, adding cryptocurrency to that, uh, to me, just never made sense to start with. Um, so I have I don't have any real problem with uh, the apps that make investing available. The, the one concern I would have is um, to the extent that they use use um, things that sort of gamify investing, making it more like a game rather than a serious decision. And I think that may lead people to risk more money than they really can afford to risk. That's really the bottom line with investing. You should not invest money that you can't afford to lose. When stock markets do well, People begin to think that they're they're convinced that they won't lose money. Uh, they start investing money that they may need, you know, to pay the the rent next month, uh, and we end up with very serious problems. So I guess I would say beware of things that make it too fun to invest because investing is not a game. If you're treating it like a game, then limit the amount of money that you're letting yourself uh, use and treat it as entertainment uh, rather than investing. Um, there's nothing wrong with buying individual stocks, although, as, as I said, I think for the majority of people, I think um, a wiser route to getting started investing uh, is through diversified mutual funds, something like a standard and poor's 500 index fund. Um, but, uh, but, but apps are another way of doing that. Um, and I think understanding where the company makes its money is one of the questions. This is something else that came up with Robin Hood that they um, were slapped a, um, a fine for. They were not disclosing that the way they were able to offer no fee trades was they were getting 
this is my word, not, not the SEC's. But they were, in essence, getting kickbacks from the platform they were using for trading stocks rather than giving the investors the optimal buying and selling prices. And they did not fully disclose that. And they got their hands slapped pretty seriously for it. So um, anytime you're given something free, you need to be asking, uh, how, are, how is this business operating? What is the business model? Uh, they're getting money from somewhere. And does it mean that they are not putting my interests first? OK, uh, next question. Would you recommend index funds to play catch up for retirement? Um, research says that over the long term and long term, we're talking five to 10 years or more, um, index funds typically outperform roughly 65% or more of actively managed funds. And so the, the, the research, the data would indicate that index funds from a totally mathematical standpoint are always preferred to actively managed funds doesn't matter whether we're talking about retirement catch up or anything else with retirement catch up i think the question that you you may be trying to ask is should you be looking at purely stock mutual funds or should you be more conservative with funds uh including some bond funds or a fund that has a combination of stocks and bonds inside and i think that is a very valid question um because the closer you are to retirement, um, the more impact a down market will have on you because you won't have time to recoup from it before you actually start drawing money from that account in retirement. And so you do generally want to be more conservative uh, as you're approaching retirement than you would have been, say, in your 40s or in your 30s. I think that may be the real question that you were trying to get at there. Um, next question, what should be done with a 401k when you retire? Convert to IRA or leave it as is? Um, there's there's not really a right or a wrong answer there. I'll tell you what the wrong answer would be. And the wrong answer is that you cash it out. Okay, that's the wrong answer. Uh, when you're talking about between leaving it in your 401k or moving it to an IRA, those are both good options because they both they both preserve the tax deferred or Roth nature of the account. Um, now, as far as deciding which to do, four hundred one k's have better protection from creditors than IRAs, but most of us aren't going to get sued. You know. Uh, so that's not probably as that big of an issue. It is one small factor, though. One of the things to consider is uh, the types of investments that are offered to you. Many 401ks are very well structured where they have um, not only no load funds available to you, but funds that also have, have low costs. They might have institutional shares of funds, which have lower costs than what you could obtain yourself if you were trying to buy the same thing inside of an IRA. Um, However, there are some 401ks that have high cost funds inside. Um, most of them have to offer nowadays appropriate investments uh, because legally there are some guidelines on that now. Um, for some people, it's an emotional decision. They don't want any more ties with their former employer. Uh, but, but in some ways, your 401k really isn't a tie to your employer. It is your money. If you were vested, uh, meaning that you got to keep all the company match when you retired, um, there's no risk. You know, if your company fails, they have no claim on the money in your 401k. It is yours. Um, so you don't need to worry about that. So it usually boils down to where can I get um, the type of investments I want with the lowest expense ratios? Um, sometimes it boils down to, you know, I've got all my, uh, I've got everything else at this one uh, 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 investment firm, and it would be easier to have everything, you know, under the same umbrella. Uh, but the, so there is no right or wrong answer here. It's um, somewhat based on how um, how well structured is your 401k? How comfortable are you with where it is? There's not a wrong answer there usually. All right. And then it looks like this is the last question, unless someone adds one. Um, if you don't have a retirement fund or a pension, 
Is it a good idea to put the max amount allowed each year in a Roth? Okay, read me that question again. Sure. If you don't have a retirement fund or a pension, is it a good idea to put the max amount allowed each year in a Roth? Okay, I assume that what the person is asking is about a Roth IRA. Uh, because Roth is, is the tax nature of an account. It's not actually an account. Um, so if you have earned income, okay, and I see that they've answered Roth IRA. If no. you have earned income, then you are entitled to put money into an IRA. Uh, if you do not have an employer plan at work available to you, then you are definitely able to contribute to a Roth IRA. The reason I said it that way is if there's an employer plan at work, uh, you may have income limits about whether or not you can contribute to a Roth IRA. But if there is no employer plan, then that's not a factor. And for sure, you could fully fund your Roth IRA. And so the short answer is if you don't have a pension, if you don't have um, a retirement plan at work to which you can contribute, you should be contributing the maximum to a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA that decision mainly to be determined by um, the tax bracket you're in now compared to the tax bracket you think you'll be in in retirement. And I would add to that, if you are married, uh, whether or not your spouse works, um, you may be able to fund for both of you, to fund an IRA for both of you. Um, and if you have any self-employed income, that may offer uh, additional possibilities for uh, contributing to a self-employed retirement plan, like an individual 401k or a SEP IRA, which would allow you to contribute more than you can to uh, a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. That's the one concern about using an IRA as your main retirement vehicle is that um, they simply have lower contribution limits than employer plans do. And so they're, they're yes, you want to fully fund them, uh, but you might also want to look for uh, for other ways to help build your retirement savings as well. All right, we have lots of people saying thank you. And another question did come in. Um, are 401ks subject to RMDs? Yes, 401ks are subject to required minimum distributions with an exception that's just come out. Uh, this is from the, uh, the Secure 2.0 Act. Previously, the only retirement plan that did not have a required minimum distribution was the Roth IRA. That is changing. Um, Roth 401ks will also not have RMDs, but I'm trying to find the effective date, um, uh, the effective date year for that. Um, and I'm not seeing it right off the bat here, but that is a change that if it's not in effect this year, it is coming in the next few years where um, if you have a 401k, that's a traditional one, you will still have an RMD, but if it's a Roth 401k, at some point, the new rule will go into effect and there will not be RMDs from a Roth 401k. And I'm sorry, I couldn't find that that year. Uh, quickly enough to tell you for sure when it happens. All right, great. That is the end of the questions. As I said, we have some thank yous. Excellent presentation. Thank you. So I will add my thanks to you for a great presentation. As always, um, I learned a lot. Oh, yep, another thank you. So, um, so thank you for coming. Thank, thanks for the presentation, and thanks to our audience for coming along for us with us tonight. My pleasure. Have a good night, everyone.